have, as I said in the Magna Carta documentary, we have a real story of Canada that is far more exciting than the fake story of a collectivist people who came into existence in 1982 out of nowhere and depend on government for everything. And that's not what young people want to hear. These millennials are very proud of their independence. Well, fine. You want independence? I've got it in Latin, okay? I've got Magna Carta for you and on. I've got courageous rebels against the established order. I've got everything that makes for an epic sword and sorcery, except it's real. And I've got a constitution of liberty as well. Because we are going to create a constitution that's part of the project that's going to put the legislature back in charge that is going to make sure that it controls its own affairs. Again, there's a story that I tell in the Magna Carta documentary when Charles I barges into Parliament with thugs with drawn swords to try and catch five of his enemies, and they're not there. And they drag the Speaker William Lenthal out of his chair, and they say, where are these five men? And Lenthal, whose life is hanging by a thread, responds, if it please your majesty, I have neither eyes to see nor tongue to speak in this house except as the members direct me. And we must preserve the independence of the legislature so that it can assert control of its own affairs. But that's not enough. Because we also are going to change the situation in the British North America Act didn't all come from Trudeau Sr., in which the federal government has all the power that's not expressly delegated to the provinces. We're going to flip that over. So the federal government can do only those things that a central government must do, provide for defense, internal free trade, <coughs> criminal justice across provincial borders. There's enough to do there for anybody who cares about peace, order, and good government. But the provinces will keep the rest, including things like education and charity. These, because the BNA actually gives those to the provinces. What the federal government's doing subsidizing universities, I have no idea. What it's doing involved in healthcare, telling the provinces how to run healthcare, I have no idea. But our constitution is going to say that the federal government cannot give money to the provinces in order to influence decisions in areas of provincial responsibility. We're going to close that one off. And these things will go back to the provinces. It'll be decentralized, it'll be experimental, it'll be accountable. There's going to be a big change there. Another thing we're going to do is bring back Buffalo. <laughs> I know, that, that's a weird round of fire, right? Buffalo is a province that never was. But when they were making provinces out of the Northwest Territories, the uh, Governor General of the, uh, Lieutenant Governor of the Territories wanted a big Western province to counterbalance the big central provinces. And Laurier said, yet. And so you didn't get this province of Buffalo that would have been Alberta and Saskatchewan. They said they split up the Western provinces, made them weak, and subordinate to the Central uh -huh. Canadian elite, which has been bad for the Federation. It's been bad for everybody, including, I think, Central Canada. So we're going to have more provinces. And again, I'm thinking big here. I'm thinking bold. We are going to split up the big provinces because they don't belong together. If you were to ask Tom Black, for instance, whether the affairs of rural Ontario are best managed from downtown Toronto, my guess is... The province of Toronto. We, province of Toronto, of course. Yeah. There's enough there to do. Yes. The province of Huronia, and maybe uh, Tabiscaming would be called the northern one, but northern Ontario is a different place. I was with a woman from northern Ontario, we were in Algonquin Park, and I was saying the north starts here, and she laughed. This is just more suburbia to her. Uh, <laughs> and then you get a situation where the rural areas have a natural community of interest across the nation, and we're going to split up Quebec. Yay. Yay. Because why would you want everybody in Quebec to feel that they're all in the same leaky boat? Why would you want the Ungava, which only joined the province in 1912, to be tied to the decisions made in downtown Montreal and in, um, in Montérégie, which to my astonishment is a population almost equal to that of Montreal? The eastern townships are a different place too. Yeah. Essentially, see, when I was a kid and the world made sense, remember when area codes only had zeros and ones in the middle digit? That's more or less your dividing lines for most of the provinces, right? You know, 705, 416, 819. These are the regions. Um, but we're also going to split up BC. Going to split Alberta into two, and the northern part's going to be Buffalo. I said I was bringing back Buffalo. That's what I meant. <laughs> we're going to create, and there's another reason for doing this. We're going to have a lot of provinces in the Federation so that we can have a real Senate. And the Senate is going to be based on the Australian model. 
We in Canada talk endlessly about the Senate, most of the time, profoundly unhappily, oh, if only, oh, if only, oh, if only. But how many people know how the Australian Senate works? No. It's amazing. It works brilliantly. Here's the deal in Australia. They have a Senate which has half as many members as their lower house, which is in their case the House of Representatives. And the Senate cannot originate money bills. Money bills have originated in the lower house in the English-speaking world since 1400, and they will continue to do so. But the Senate can take initiative in all kinds of legislation, and it can send money bills back to the house if it doesn't like them. It can do all kinds of things. So how do you have a prime minister? How do you have confidence votes? Well, it, it's marvelous. I can't believe I only found out about this a few years ago. If the two houses deadlock, Normally, the, the House of Representatives has elections as ours does on a, on a regular basis, but also if a ministry falls. The Senate just has these six-year memberships, that, and the Senate's always in existence. But if the two houses deadlock on a bill and can't get things sorted out, you dissolve both houses. You have a fresh election, you send the bills back to both houses. If they still deadlock, they sit as one body, one member, one vote, settle the thing, and life goes on. Now, in the entire history of Australia, there have only been six of these so-called double dissolutions. And there's only ever been one sitting as a joint body. Because you don't have to do it because everybody can count. They can see what's going to happen. The lower house is twice as numerous. It will prevail unless the lower house is very evenly divided and the regents are firmly on one side or the other. In which case, there's no, again, there's no point in having the double dissolution because you all know how it's going to turn out. And the lower house will give way. And this gives the provinces a major say in the legislative affairs of the country, and it creates a powerful, though subordinate, house of the legislature that is not bound to the legislature and its agenda, but to the provinces. And this is a very major step in making the legislature, again, a guarantee of liberty instead of a tool of the executive. We're also, by the way, going to make the parliament bigger. I can't work miracles here, but one of the problems with the Parliament is the fact that so many of its members can have or be believe they're going to get executive branch posts. The British House of Commons has over 600 members, many of whom are never, ever, ever going to be the right honorable whoever. And they know it, so instead they busy themselves with committee work. They are resistant to party whips. They are genuinely more independent. Now, if I had my way, and some of you know I've said this before, members of the legislature would give themselves much bigger office budgets and hire researchers. Because our members of parliament have four assistants. Two are in the riding, two are in Ottawa. And one of them is doing all the admin stuff. They've got one person who is not terribly well paid tracking issues and events up against an enormous bureaucracy that's there all the time. An American senator from California could have as many as 60 staffers. And even if 30 of them are in the riding and 15 of them in Washington are doing admin, that's 15 people on a senator's staff doing policy work. Every committee that a senator is on, they have got a staffer who is full or at least half time on the subject matter of that committee alone. Our legislators have no idea what's going on and everybody likes it that way. Now, I'm not putting that in the Constitution, though, you know. De minimis lex non cura. The law does not concern itself with trifles, neither does the Constitution. That's one reason ours is going to be shorter. I was just looking at the Consolidated Canadian Constitution. It's 101 pages. Are you kidding me? Rubbish. The American Constitution is nothing like that long because it doesn't deal with idiocy. It, and our new one won't. It's going to be a lot shorter. It's going to stick to basics. It's going to have a charter of rights that says... Thou shalt not, the government, over and over again, like the American Bill of Rights, thou shalt not make any law infringing freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association. No law taking property except for public use through due process with just and timely compensation. No law infringing the right of the people to defend themselves. There Amen. will be no free lunches in that. There will be no equalization. No, oh, yeah. None whatsoever. What is this thing? And why does it exist? It's absolutely preposterous. All that stuff is out. There will be no collective rights. There will be no affirmative action. And there will be no social engineering. This being Canada, we are going to put in a clause saying the government, you know, the, the, you're going to be entitled to service in the two official languages from government 
under reasonable circumstances, in dealing with Parliament, if you're on trial for your life, if you're dealing with the head office of a major crown corporation. But there will be no effort to influence the language in which a mother sings to her children, or a businesswoman deals with her customers. That is not the business of government. We don't need its help to figure out how to talk, and we don't benefit from its efforts to intrude upon it. So that is out. And there will be far fewer powers granted to the central government, and therefore far, far fewer opportunities for it to get up to mischief of any sort. And this constitution is going to put the people back in charge in a very fundamental way. It is going to be put to them in a referendum. That is how we do this. Yes. Because that might sound like the most un-Canadian part of the whole project. But it, again, that's only if you have been deceived about your history. Magna Carta preserves rights that came up from the people over centuries. The English common law comes from the people. Again, this is in the Magna Carta documentary. The Bill of Rights in 1688 defends the rights of the people, and it comes out of a parliament that stands for the nation. And when the British North America Act was brought forward, there was a lively debate in Canada about whether it's necessary to have a referendum. There was no question that the people needed to be consulted. There wasn't debate about how you did it. And finally, what most people, some people said, oh no, the legislature is the body politic, they can do it. But other people said, uh-uh, uh-uh. That, that is leaving out the actual citizens. Other people said, you know, we should have a referendum, and then people said, well, we, that's not really how we do things. So finally the decision was, what we need to do is dissolve the legislatures, go to the people in a fresh election where it is clear that confederation is the issue. And that is how it was done almost everywhere. And therefore, those legislatures that voted for confederation did so after the issue was taken to the people, and they said, yay. It wasn't done perfectly, but it was done. This is how Canadians do things, and it has to be, because... The, if these fundamental law doesn't come from the people, it has no legitimacy. The 1982 Constitution did not come from the people. It was passed in a manner so bizarre that nobody can tell you what it was. It is not an act of the British Parliament, because if it were the British Parliament, could amend it. But nobody who wants to amend the Constitution says, let's ask Westminster. It is not an act of the Canadian Parliament, because the Canadian Parliament cannot amend it. But no Parliament could bind its successor. But it did come about because of a request from Parliament, headed by Pierre Trudeau, who was the Prime Minister of Canada because he had 74 out of 75 Quebec seats. 